even though I was quite comfortable there, I was going to get executed. They said mm. they were going to make an example of a Westerner, and I think I was it. So, so I had to. There was a time it. limit there. Yeah. If you get caught, you're finished. You cannot get caught. That's what put most people off. I couldn't get people to go with me. Mm -hmm. I had to go out the old-fashioned way, which was um, cut my way out of the cell bars. It's great to have you back, David. Obviously, we've met before, but for anyone who doesn't know who you are, for new listeners or new viewers, could you give us a brief introduction to what you are famous for? Well, I suppose uh, most well known for uh, having escaped a prison in Thailand, in Bangkok, uh, the biggest one they have there, Klong Prem. It uh, wasn't something I did frivolously. Uh, I was going to be executed within a couple of weeks, so it seemed like a good time to leave. <laughs> okay. Now, um, we're going to get into that in a bit more detail, but one thing that I remember about you uh, from last time is you're the most incredible talker, and we took away the, interview, the initial interview we'd done with you and ended up having to make it into two long episodes because you have a lot of different, very colorful uh, experiences. So do forgive me if I jimmy us through. A, oh, a few, no, I can understand bit. that. Yeah. I mean, the only place I never talk is in a police station. So. <laughs> Always and on like brands. some of my uh, <laughs> uh, work colleagues that, uh, took, uh, what was it? One slap to get them talking, but five to shut them up. Oh. So. <laughs> okay, so let's go right back to the beginning. Um, you were born in the UK, and then I believe you emigrated to Australia. Well, um, it was all a family thing. Yes, I was born in Bayswater in London. I uh, spent the first few years of my life then uh, there, but my uh, parents broke up, mm. divorced, and I went with my mother to Australia with my older sister. So I don't have any really very early memories of London, apart from some old 8 millimeter movie footage of me learning to walk in Hyde Park. My dad was waving a five-pound note in front of my face, and I was making every effort to grab it. And I continued that behavior for many, many years afterwards. Returned to Australia, um, finished some schooling, um, got really contrasting jobs. I uh, worked in an ad agency for a while. Um, but also before that, I was uh, got a job in a cinema. Now... It was the, an under, literally an underground place. But it was there that I got introduced to a bunch of crooks. Um, some of the girls there had boyfriends that uh, used to run down with uh, um, strange boxes or bits of money or fur coats and mm. then wink at me, bolt out the back door, pursued by often policemen, uh, undercover ones, of course whom we'd misdirect somewhere. But that circle, they were um, safe crackers, and they really didn't trust outsiders and didn't much like the sound of me, but mm, because of I demonstrated a couple of things by being... Look, everybody was really very anti-authority then. I, I don't mean hostile, but... Um, for people now, they, they, they wouldn't have experienced that in the uh, late 60s, 70s. We were so snotty and arrogant, we really thought we were going to change the world mm. and that mm, the laws were all nothing and the way to change them was to break them. Well, that was the kind of vanity we had. So um, when I got to know the safe crackers uh, better, there was something really interesting. I mean, I didn't like the idea, you know, stealing things seemed a bit tacky. But on the other hand, they kind of all needed the money from, the, from their backgrounds and everything. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't so much the, the interest. It was the technicalities of getting into these things. Mm, okay. Um, they used to drill through the top. Um, having anchored it with uh, the drill with clamps and, and put a kind of little lens inside, a cystoscope used in medicine, 
and watch the the wheels turning around. So this is the old and kind of old fashioned Hollywood it, style. It, it was, kind of yeah. And uh, behind the safe were three discs, and you had to line them up. And they'd when, once they got in, they'd take the door with them, so that the opposition, the safe makers, wouldn't know how they'd got oh. in. And it was a, a a constant battle between the manufacturers and them, because they'd come across new uh, safes, which had uh, special metals in it that was mixed like a, a crunchy nut bar, very hard metals, very soft ones, so the drill bit would slip on them, oh. and snap, and you got a sense that this was almost like a game, where. Um, they would try something and then try to beat them. And they were very loyal to each other. Um, they, they never spoke out of school, as it were. Um, when I got involved with them, I'd only have to, if I had trouble, I'd only have to make one phone call and people would appear out of nowhere. I thought, yeah, this, this is kind of better than the treacherous boys' school that mm. I, I, I grew up in. And how old were you at this point? Um, what, 19 years old? 19. Mm. So were you thinking you were making a conscious decision to move into illegal activities or at that point in time and at that point in the world, did it feel like more of a kind of a bit of roguish fun, would you say? I was drawn to it anyway because it was interesting and um, I didn't really have a lot of fear. I think sometimes what we do or don't do is depending on how scary it seems. Yeah, agreed. Um I was born with a low resting heart rate, as they say. You know, if it's uh, below 70, you're a risk taker. I don't know why that is. When the safe crackers retired, they uh, put some of their money into growing little crops of weed and so on. But profit margin is, is only through importing because right. of the price difference. It's, it's cheap in the source countries, expensive where it sells. So because they couldn't do it, they were almost throwing it down like a challenge, like, well, we don't know anybody who can do this. And I thought, well, I traveled a lot. Um, I didn't think it was going to be impossible. Um, I thought the odds were in my favor. And, and I looked it up. I went to the library and sort of researched it a bit. And where were you thinking? Which country? At this point? Well, they, um, they were very keen to get some... Um, hashish from India or right. Nepal or somewhere. Okay, I could see you know, it's bulky and there's packing problems. So um, they funded me and off I sailed. Now, the operation, my first operation was so deplorably bad. I'm barely 20 years old. I, my cunning plan, which involved a big piece of exported machinery which had weights in it, so the weights would come out, oh, the right. hash would go in, it would weigh the same being returned. I think it was a piece of television equipment or something. That went south immediately when I didn't realize that I would have to pay a huge deposit in duty to even bring it in as a demo machine, so forget that. I ended up, in short, with meeting a guy in a money exchange uh, section of a bank. I was there because I ran out and I had to send asking for more from the boys. Right. And I met him and he wasn't involved in any of this, but he soon became that. Just <laughs> He managed to get me six kilos of hash. I took the 1952 ancient Grundig radio from his parents' house, the, the shelf there, gutted the thing like a fish, wrapped it up, very hard to get cling film in those days. I mean, think of this before you travel. <laughs> Arriving with a suitcase full of cling film doesn't look good, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, wedged it in there and then just flew back to Sydney. Now, you can imagine what happened. Well, just before we get on to what happened, you know, one thing that strikes me is what year was would this have been? This Roughly. was uh, 77. 77. So it's amazing to think that back then, if someone was going to India for the first time now, yeah. they could go on Google Maps, they could research it all, they could find out who, they could find phone numbers, contacts, they could be put in contact with people before they've even set off. Whereas you must have at that age, at that time, been going in slightly blind, you know, touching down in a foreign country that you didn't know well, no contacts. Was that not quite daunting? 
Well, what was more um, troubling was um, how everything would fail, and then I'd have to um, you know, come up with another plan. What contacts? I, somebody I knew um, um, knew an old bank robber who joined the Hare Krishnas and fled to India. Right. And I had his name and, and the ashram in Delhi where, where he was, was supposed to have been. Uh, I didn't really catch up with him on that trip. Well, okay, sure. So, that, so then you get back to Australia with your radio that is now full to the brim with. And I get stopped. You, you, you did get stopped, okay. I get stopped because uh, I'm, I'm on a British passport um, and it's the only trip I've ever done and I'm that age. I'd stop me. You know? mm. <laughs> Old fatherly type was at the customs desk. Now, they, the, the systems were different in those days. Um, it was Sydney, too, which is very, and it certainly was very relaxed back then. Right. He opened the suitcase. Uh, there was nothing in there except a pair of socks and a towel wrapping <laughs> okay. up this massive radio, which he lifted up, so it was buckled at the sides, little red packets poking out. Oh, it smelled like you know, a head shop full of patchouli. Or something <laughs> okay. like that. Not much of a disguise. No. Um, he let me go. He uh, put it back, looked around to make sure that none of his workmates were watching him being so soft, um, and then turned to me and said, you going back there? You going to do this again? All right, you can take your, we'll call it a radio, shall we? And get out of here. What he thought, I realized later, was that he didn't want the whole drama of the day, arresting me, filling out papers, it, and it would have been a, a long day. Plus, I guess, being a dad, he thought, if I, he's obviously an idiot. Mm, <laughs> right. If I send him into Gladiator Academy, or it wasn't really like that in those days, but certainly contact center, um, the prison. What am I doing? Um, mm. Well, I guess, I guess uh, he was hopeful. <laughs> you know, I waltzed out of there, master smuggler me. <laughs> <laughs> but I experienced then what um, I got years later, which was kind of a real downer after... You know, having got nowhere with the Hare Krishnas and, and cultivated the shoeshine boys and had my money stolen at Amex uh, by some scallywags in Delhi, all sorts of little adventures over mm. there in India, and nonetheless made it, it's kind of like that's all there is to it. I, I didn't really want to give it to anyone. Um, so it felt like... You didn't have a big moment of... No. And, and, and success. the bit of money that came, uh, yeah, that's handy. Right. Uh, I paid back what I owed and settled up for, for the next thing. So, but, but once that was started, when you, sorry, I interrupted you, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, to, to finish it, even though they'd funded me, the guys were very surprised to see me back. Mm. Well, at all? At all. Oh, you made it. Because uh, some of them say, oh, he'll just run away with it. You know? uh, even if that's what he's doing, who knows what he's doing. And then I could see sitting around, you can imagine there's like a, a table full of, well, like three guys, and then a kind of darkness shrouded over that room. And I thought, eh, it's not valuable enough to kill me. <laughs> you know? mm. well, what is this mood? Why did you bring that? Well, that's what you've been talking about. Yeah, you could have loaded that with cocaine or smack or something like that. But, but, but you guys have been saying nothing but terrible things about A-class or heavy drugs. Don't want to know about it. And I could read then that, wait a minute, that we all might be guys together and having fun getting into the safe and whatnot, but there was a kind of different, it was something, a very strong lesson. I'd, I'd have to be thoughtful about that. Um, there could be times where things didn't work out. Not necessarily that my safety was at risk. I didn't see it that way, but I knew that there were ruthless people there. Right, okay, yeah. So you got an insight into a mindset that had been a bit below the surface. 
it yeah. was there. I just mm. chose not to see it. Mm. But um, I then went on to you know, refine everything and vary everything. It, and then did you, after that first time, did you, were you still working sort of for them or did you immediately, <clears throat> excuse well, me, when did you things, break up on your own? When things um, picked up and there was enough money around, out of uh, out of strategy rather than just being a nice guy, I gave my partners a kind of thank you bonus from the next thing that mm. I did, but I did that all myself. Right, so it was almost so, like a yeah separation. And I wanted to go back to the my hippie friends anyway. They were a little less. It wasn't that they were scary, but but that didn't last because they were the hippie friends might be all right, but they were certainly careless and stupid. But from from that point onwards, after that initial journey, was that you then into the world of smuggling? I thought this won't last forever. You only need one setback and that changes it. Mm. Uh, I probably made quite a lot of money and I could have got out, but, and I should have got out. You know, I had couriers. A leak from one of the, the couriers brought the police to me. And here was the problem with it. It was, at first I, I scattered. Now, I was married to my first wife then, Clelia, mm -hmm. an Italian girl. Her dad had restaurants. I grabbed her. I had a, a secret drawer with extra passports in it, some mm -hmm. money. Ended up four plane journeys later in um, off the Bahamas. Uh, had the skipper of a day rent yacht uh, take me out to an island that nobody had ever been on before. It was empty. Sat there on a towel and thought, hmm. The level of surveillance I had means it's quite a big operation. They're funded. Mm -hmm. And I checked with a lawyer before. The bigger the money they spend, the more determined they'll be. Mm -hmm. Stay away or go back. I mean, I don't know, Ben, why would anybody do this? Uh, well, I wasn't broke. Um, I didn't have to. There was no pressure on me. The more I went through the problems, the more attractive the whole thing right. was. Right, okay. Was, uh, she didn't like it much. Well, again, do you think because it was a puzzle to be solved? Because um, <sighs> arrogance, really. We've gone from basically someone who was kind of mildly interested in making a group of people, me meeting a group of um, safe hackers, to someone mm. who pulled off their first thing, and then we've jumped to someone who has people working for them, and and now is no longer taking the risk themselves. Now the police are on to you, and you're on this desert island, well, small island, mm. and you're thinking about going back into it. Was this like a turning point in your life in terms of going, you know, because the other option, I suppose, was to go straight. But were you just more, it, was that just not an option for you? I'd gone to my lawyer, Ralph. He said, look, this is what I picked up. Because I, uh, my travel agent had tipped me to a couple of detectives that come in. Your travel agent? Yeah. Uh, wow. He was in on the firm. <laughs> okay. Uh, acted all innocent. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, you know, and and gave him a long list of names um, to, that they wanted travel details for and a telephone number, which I traced uh, to um, a private office building, mm -hmm. which had been rented by state and federal police. Mm -hmm. They were so distrusting of their own they didn't want to even run this thing from um, regular police headquarters. And uh, my lawyer said, well, what, are you sure it's you? I said, Ralph, look at the list of names. There's 30 there. I'm 26 of them. <laughs> Passports were a lot easier to get back then than they are now. So you had 26 aliases that you were traveling on. Yeah. And they yeah. Were, right, okay. Um, and I described where they were. He said, David, they are funded well. They are not, bear this in mind. But Ralph, they, they, I, what, they won't get me with anything. They're funded. You think they're going to walk away after a year and say, oh, sorry, boss, mm. we spent a million dollars and uh, nothing doing. Mm. They don't work like that. <laughs> but this is how stubborn I was. I thought, because he said the only thing you can do is disappear for at least a couple of years, and then you can come back if that's what you want. And 
Of course, I, I had justifications for it. I thought, okay, I'll, I'll build up a bit more money and then I'll disappear. But um, it was only after things went terribly badly that I realized I shouldn't play like this anymore. What it was, they... Um, uh, because the challenges kept coming. The, the, well, so now, so did you go back to Australia? I went back to Australia, and, and but then I retired within three months. Right, but they weren't waiting for you to arrest you, or no, no, they no. wanted they wanted something solid. Okay, um, I won't go into the, the long yes. machinations yeah, of yeah. it all, but um, somebody we knew uh, was getting things from a Thai courier, and he got arrested, he sold us out to the police so that the, the courier would now come to us and oh, I have see. some solid evidence right. that he would bring things. But we got away with that because that was another challenge. But the police got tired of all this, arrested me. There were no drugs, of course, so it was a difficult case. The worst kind of case is that where there's no solid evidence. Mm -hmm. I'd, in, in a way, it's... Better to go to court where you've got a smoking gun and a dead body on the ground because at least you know where you are. But where there's nothing tangible, and it's conspiracies. And this was a huge trial, six months long. Mm. Uh, what was it? 119 witnesses, 6,000 pages of uh, telephone intercepts. Massive thing. What made it worse too, and I think this was um, what changed things for me, um, the pressure was put on for confessions, but it would be silly to confess. Uh, and you can't confess on somebody else's behalf, can mm -hmm. you? And that's not nice. Um, lots of the family were arrested. Even my mother was taken in at one stage. Oh, wow. Just to put pressure on. Uh, did she know what you did? Uh, she had an idea. Right, uh, okay. I mean, I used to have bin liners full of money I'd leave behind the fridge. At place. <laughs> yeah, you don't get that in the cinema, do you? <laughs> not on a... <laughs> <laughs> Not a very good day, you know. <laughs> uh, because they'd arrested so many people. Now, when they arrested our wives and my mm -hmm. business partner, Michael, his wife had just had a baby. It was, we had to do a deal here. I didn't want to, but I was going to say, I said to Michael, look, I know you don't like it, but we'll plead to it. Get the girls out of trouble. We'll escape. Mm. That's a good challenge, that one. Mm. <laughs> um, but unfortunately... Um, the intelligence section put a, an arsonist informer in with the girls to get some information. A fire was lit, uh, burnt down the women's prison, and my wife and my business partner's wife was were killed. That's um, awful. And so the informer that they put in there. Yeah, the why, why did they pick an arsonist for Cron? Daniel Wright, her name was. I don't know why I remember that after 40 years. God. So that's quite a big. That was. Oh, and. and just uh, to make things worse, the, the story put about town to scare the couriers into talking because they wouldn't speak mm. was that we'd, we were killing off all the witnesses and starting with our own family. Oh, God. Where does that come from? Um, we ended up in a supermax prison, nightmarish electronic zoo with two-inch glass and electronic doors and insane inmates. Held 48, death rate, 27 people a year died in that little supermax. Going to court in chains with the SWAT team taking it, it was so, so much. Michael fell to pieces. He was just a wreck. He didn't make it. Uh, he survived the jail but died when he got out. The only way I could survive all of that was to strip away everything. I, you know, I found myself in the supermax concrete. Everything's concrete, the bed, everything. There's no, everything's steel. You can't. Just with the tape player from my lawyer, listening to the the tapes, the bug tapes, the microphones in my house, mm. I could play back my life for the last six months. Clelia moving from room to room, taking telephone calls. She was crying about something. I didn't know what. I never know. So, uh, David, that's gone. Immerse yourself in the worst that they have. You will not survive this otherwise. Uh, the trial sort of went. Not so good, acquitted of most things, but convicted enough, 10 years. A difficult imprisonment, but I, the only way I could deal with it was to say, did I want revenge? <laughs> that was more my fault. Mm -hmm. I brought this about. I got her in there. I mean, the family were very 
kind to me about it, considering I wouldn't be, but it doesn't matter. In chains and supermax, strip it all away. It is nothing. Everyone is a potential enemy. Everything, it just, nothing mattered. Win the day, win the night. I mean, this is a place you had to fill in a book to get some toilet paper. Mm. The showers were in front of them in a glass box. Um, if you went on a visit, they'd zip you up and lock you in a suit so you had no pockets. There was, after that and her death, I felt like there was nothing that could affect me. Mm. You're wrong about these things. You know, we're, we're human. But I got out and they were there. They even visited me to say, we'll be on you when you get out. The police. Yeah. We enjoyed the old days, didn't you? Yeah, I said, pretending, you know. And just to make the point, they were there when I got out. Um, I, I'd done a whole lot of woodwork in the prison in the last place I was at, carving intricate things, making these really great trick Chinese boxes with beeswax. They intercepted the van that was taking it from the prison back to my house and smashed it all to pieces oh. and put it in a box just to say, don't think that we will never be here. We can do what we want. So... I decided to leave the country. I was, um, how old am I by then? Let's work it out. Yeah. Uh, I started all this mischief when I was about 18, got arrested at 22, 23, uh, um, 16 years, 17 years, either under surveillance or in, in mm. bad prisons, got out and I'm under surveillance again. Um, so how old? So you know, about thirty-seven. About thirty-seven. Mm. So that's already, you know, that's a big chunk of life there. But you've mm. lost quite a lot of it to prison or surveillance. At no point now were you like, okay. I, need I to wasn't a normal person uh, really when I got out uh, because of the experience of prison. I'd already stripped most of myself away to deal with the death, the Superman. Yeah, and and watching people be burnt to death in the place, which was frequent. Somebody had contact glue poured all over him and then satellite. Oh, God. Guards came in and the other one standing there with a guitar swinging it around to make sure, let him burn, let him burn. Jesus. Barry, his name was. Testicles swollen like apples, but black. <laughs> okay. Died two hours later in hospital. Anyway, um, that was a regular occurrence. To deal with that, I already stripped things away. So when I got a little apartment when I got out and my mother had arranged things for me, when they were there, when they'd leave rude messages on my arts machine, when, when they'd be behind me everywhere, I thought, all right, remember this, David, it never ends. If you're to survive, go back to the way you were, you know, in the, in the supermax. Anything can happen any time. But I didn't want to live like that. Um, I got a fresh passport by the most elaborate means. Um, I could spend a week explaining how that came into existence. But I went to Thailand to pick up some money. I got arrested there. I, only, I had three days there. And it was just before Christmas. I left at that time on purpose so that they, they maybe, I thought maybe it's their weak point that they want to have families and a life just at Christmas. I parked my mum's car and, and left the keys somewhere for her. And nobody knew. Were you not meant to leave the country? No, no, no. Oh, I'm still oh, under I see. Uh, right. licenses. Oh, I see. We're just going to take a minute here to talk about a sponsor of this show, which is Manscaped. We were sent a package to try out by Manscaped, but Connor, one of our producers, is already a fan of the brand, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. I've been using Manscaped for a little while now. And Ben, as you know, it's that time of year where people start asking you what you want for Christmas. And I would say that a great gift for a man, especially mm -hmm. one that might have everything mm -hmm. is the Manscaped Performance Package 4.0. So what's in that? So you get the Lawnmower 4.0 electric trimmer. Mm -hmm. You get some anti-chafe boxer shorts, which I can vouch for, as well as a couple of other grooming products that smell great. Fantastic. Well, it sounds like a five-star review from you, Connor. Absolutely. So Connor, you were talking about the Performance Package. There's loads of other great gift ideas, such as the Hygiene Bundle, all available at manscaped.com and all gifts that men will genuinely love to receive this Christmas. If you are a listener of this podcast, you get 20% off and free shipping. All you have to do is go to manscaped.com and use the code MINUTES. That's manscaped.com, M-I-N-U-T-E-S, MINUTES. Um, 
So why are we doing that? The risk, is it worth it? I didn't want to play anymore. Right. I wanted to uh, see if I could have a something resembling like a, a real life, just okay. find some corner of the world. plan was to, to return to London. and Oh, so you were leaving forever? Uh, leaving forever. Okay, yeah, I see. Yeah, nobody knew it. Um, I had a couple of hundred thousand in uh, Thailand, I, I thought. Um, which uh, I returned to pick up. Um, now, I suppose people say this, crooks always say this, the most unusual circumstances led to my arrest. Well, really? it, they were, but then again, they always are, aren't they? Or you wouldn't be telling the story or you wouldn't have been arrested. But um, the USDA was involved, lots of people, lots of players. Uh, no real drugs were found, uh, they did an airport sweep and listed me up for like an ounce of something and a false passport or two. The money I had just disappeared into pockets. But those, when I arrived there, I felt so free. I knew this identity was good. I was like floating on air, really. I'd, I'd slipped out of my protective mode. You know that one where you stick to the plan and, all right, you don't want to leave. I, I should have even stayed there for six months. Just mm -hmm. get some sensible view of the world. But I I didn't. Uh, and as I went to the airport, I could see they were all around me. And I melted back into the crowd and disappeared again. I thought, well, that serves me right for changing that attitude I'd had from back in Supermax. You know, just glaze over, concentrate on the details which I'd needed to do because when I went to make a phone call, they were at the travel agency uh, waiting. It was so depressing being thrown into the Thai prison, and I had some idea what they'd be like. Um, and people I'd known had, had been arrested there. I knew this much. You never win a case, you never get out. <laughs> well, you get out. And what were they arresting you for? Was it the... the, uh, the passport... Um, what did they leave? the man, money wasn't I mean what did they leave 4,000 or something like that right and uh, their airport sweep had um, I saw the guy walking in with it in a plastic bag you know whatever people throw on the floor before mm. they go through security there was um, a bit of hash this usual bits of weed but what they really wanted was um this 25 grams of heroin because that would finish me off. Mm -hmm. A policeman, an um, Australian one, said, was that yours? Yeah, yeah, sure it was. Uh, he said, I didn't think so. What would you be carrying around that for? I mean, if it was 10 kilos, I might understand, but but that was enough for the death penalty. And, and was it yours? No, no, no. So I where where had that come from? If you do, they do a sweep every afternoon at five o'clock. They right. get tons of it. Right. And they get, you know, nervous passengers go up and then they change their minds and they throw it in the toilet or Got whatever. You. You know. And were they just, did, did, do you think they believed it was yours or do you think they were just going, this is, we need to give him this bit? No, no, I think they were using it, hoping to, that would be good to hold and maybe they could get something else, find out what I was up to, who I was seeing. Because I had met um, somebody who's whose uncle was a big player. Right. Um, so uh, there was, there was. I think they were optimistic there might be more come, come out of it, but, mm -hmm. but there wasn't. But what difference did it make? Mm. And I wasn't really worried about um, those drugs or, or the death penalty. I wanted to die anyway, frankly. My first escape plans from there had this, I imagined getting out to find the privacy to kill myself. Right. I wanted to go to the Dusitani Hotel. I knew which floor and where to get onto the roof. I'd taken photographs from there many years before. Um, there were, you simply couldn't get a moment's peace. Dormitories with 150 guys in them screaming all night. Um, you can't even take a crap in peace in, mm. in, a, in a tight prison. Were you not afraid, though? <clears throat> of what? Killing myself? Well, no, I mean... I don't know, being brutalized by the guards or the inmates oh, or... Well, I knew enough about Thailand to, to know that it was a little more comic than than bad, though very bad things happened. They used to um, 
They've beaten people, a couple of people get beaten to death every day there, but it's a very big prison. We have to get that in proportion. Mm. I only wish they wouldn't use the food trolley to take the dead bodies out because, oh um, you know, they don't clean them up. Um, and could you speak the language or were you quite, was it quite difficult to communicate? Uh, not really. Uh, and the few languages that I've picked up in my travels, I always found that even if you know them, it's better to pretend you don't. Okay. Um, because they'll talk about you behind your back, you know. <laughs> Certainly did in Lebanon. <laughs> There was, I, I just couldn't see any point. I'd gone to such elaborate precautions uh, on this trip. Um, it just shouldn't have happened. And I even got away from the airport and still it happened. Mm. All, all that confidence that I'll figure a way out, I didn't care anymore. I just had enough. Um, and I remember seeing an old guy there. If you had to go to court, they put chains on you and um, you'd line up on the ground. Now, this old guy, I was looking at him because I don't know why. A big sand truck went past. He had the presence of mind to push his head under that sa sand truck. And, oh, it twisted it around, popped like a watermelon being dropped on the ground. It oh, my God. Guys were very annoyed, told the trustees to get that thing away out of sight. Was that not disturbing almost thing? Thing? I almost applauded. I thought, you... Brave bastard, you. Yeah. You've got the guts to do that. Was it not quite a disturbing thing to witness? No. Uh, a little shocking because if you haven't seen it, mm. uh, kind of thing, up close, mm. and I happened to be looking, um, it was, uh, but that, that's how I felt about it. But I was saved in the end by a con man. Mm -hmm. Now, people say a lot of th bad things about con men. They do, yes. They do. And they are, can't be trusted. <laughs> uh, they are rotters. And they will cheat you just because they're the scorpion. That's in their nature. Uh, but sometimes they're just what you need. Mm -hmm. And this rather smooth um, Bostonian American um, who spoke Thai and really knew his way around, you know, I, you know, I thought the... Somewhere in this huge prison, there'd be an enclave of rich and corrupt foreigners with loads of money mm. and there'd be luxuries. It wasn't. There was nobody of any importance in there. You know, a couple of big sacrifices had been made, but um, a couple of very rich uh, policemen who were in the hospital in intensive care. Uh, but other than that, there were, it was just the... Um, the people who'd reached the absolute bottom mm. drifters in Asia who did run after run and then got sacrificed to the machine. Mm. They'd get about four jobs. There was a big syndicate there operating. Couriers would run four times, bang, they'd shop them to the police, they'd be gone. Oh, God. They all told the same story. Hey, it was Joe, it was this guest house, it was such and such, identical. And... Um, and, and at this point, had you been sentenced to death? Had you received no. the death penalty? Oh, no, no, no. I, I was trying to avoid that. Yeah. But once I came to my senses, because the, the the Boston con had so many wonderful schemes, medical thing to get me bail, know some way of a, a escape, with a go to court, I get snatched from there. I had villains come over and, and scope out the court to, because there was a, a way, I thought, of, of getting out of there from the lift that took you up to the, the, the building, um, snatched from the middle as you go down, changed into a different set of clothes. But they all got scared. thing about um, some of our most loved uh, and fearless villains, they're pretty good in the local manner, but you throw them into a place like that <laughs> where people carry machine guns and shoot at will just for the hell of it, mm. not so confident. Mm. They, they like the upper edge of being sneaks. Um, so I couldn't convince anybody to really help, and it was just as well. Um, and two and a half years passed there uh, in this prison. It's a long time. It was, I sort of perked up a little bit, pulled myself together, started exercising, um, got a couple of ATM cards over, had my favorite guard. Um, he was in charge of the, the building, bought myself a room, renovated, um, 
So you had you'd bought a room within the prison that was just for you, or rented, I suppose. Rented, you right? Say, you know, um, and is that an official thing that you're allowed to no, do, or is that no, a backhand no, kind no, of? No, right. No. There so are you, places in the world where it's official, but, right? Uh, but you had an influx of money that you could pay for special treatment. You could survive there on <clears throat> less than five hundred pounds a month and be king. Oh wow! Was this the seventies or the eighties? Now, by the way, we're into um, ninety. 495. Because what's reported about you is that during the 80s, you were a multimillionaire. Um, is that accurate? Huh. Um, now, what do we call a multimillionaire? Some <laughs> young halfwit with uh, a million and a quarter on a co glass coffee table who looks around the living room and thinks, I've got to get a sofa one of these days. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> who uh, goes to the car auctions in the morning, buys a big yank tank with a 427 Chevy engine in it, um, drives it around, makes his own ca car parking spaces, you know, smashing the front end, backing the other one, pushing the other cars out of the way. Um, oh, stoned off my head most of the time. Mm. Uh, if I wasn't stoned enough, I'd take a few mandrakes, just to <laughs> quaaludes, icing on the cake. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> so I didn't take care of the money and the money didn't take care Fine. of me. So I guess I'm, I, the reason I, the reason I asked was because it must have been quite a stark change going from, uh, a very rich existence to basically somewhere where you basically couldn't pay for anything initially mm. and it was a very poor existence. But I guess from what you're saying there, it's well, not like you felt like you were rich at the time. Um, i made that contrast a few times when I had my first big arrest I, I couldn't as I was in a cold near lightless cell of bluestone and horsehair mattress about two inches thick and reeking of piss I would think back to the night before when mm. I had my uh, imported Italian huge bed mm. and uh, Irish linen sheets and swimming pool out there and um It'd be hard to kind of shake off the contrast. Sometimes. Well, that rubber banding must must have been hard to take because it's you're going from basically the aspiration of almost everyone where you're talking about just buying cars outright and having a swimming pool to a piss stinking bed. You know, it must be... It was... You know what's the odd thing about it was providing I could see a way out or work a way out, I didn't so much mind. Oh, okay. Um, I really trained myself to expect my whatever world I built up, and, and this happened several times, I've done it five times, had a new identity, new life, new surroundings, even new people, and bang, they're gone. Mm. And every time it got worse. Um, and there was even, um, Thailand was you know, desperately important because even though I was quite comfortable there, I was going to get executed. They said mm. they were going to make an example of a Westerner, and I think I was it. Um, you know, I was somebody that nobody minded killing. Um, so so I had to. There's had a to. time limit there. Yeah. There's nothing like the prospect of being executed by a machine gun, which is the way they oh did God, it. Oh, God, is that what it would have been? Wow. Yeah. I, you know, they, oh, they'd have three guards all with a bit of string on the trigger, and they'd all pull at once so that none of them could be... Um, Condemned in the Buddhist sense of sin. Oh, they don't have which actually, gun. Right, I see. You know, caused yeah. the bullet that finished you off. Oh, I see. So you're in the Thai prison. You've been sentenced to a rather unpleasant death penalty. Um, how did you start coming up with this famous plan for escaping? Um, mm, desperation. It was the last mm -hmm. plan that looked like it was going to work. Uh, there were probably about 20 plans considered. Um, everything from um, being the prison held, I've since found out it holds 22,000 people oh my God. in 10 sub prisons. Uh, there's a women's section, there's a young offenders, there's a special remand, a, a drug unit, all of that. Uh, just a wild place. It has everything. It even had a, a prisoner run shop where you could extract, you could borrow money against your account and cash. Anyway. Um, one of the plans involved being welded into a VW combi van in the uh, prison's auto workshop, which would be picked up early Monday morning and I'd be driven out in that. 
Another one was, um, there were several courtroom ones. And you couldn't just pay your way out? No, no, it's just, you could pay to have uh, a mobile phone, which in those days was a rare thing, but they were around. Um, you could pay for a bottle of Klong uh, whiskey. You could pay, I'm sure, you could pay to get a, a, a girl in your room if you could work out what a room was. <laughs> Uh, uh, they had a whole section full of lady boys there and oh, a wow. building full of them. They used to open it up on Saturdays. So um, you, you could pay for anything but not to leave. They couldn't cover that and they couldn't trust each other. You would need 25, 30 different guards paid mm -hmm. off and and the guards visitors. I mean, it, it, too many gates. No, that wouldn't work. And, and they looked at it as a kind of betrayal. I only ever saw two escapes attempts there. One group of uh, street kids and a Singaporean got out of their cell, incredibly, uh, turned themselves into the sleeping guard when they all lied to each other about what they didn't have, you know, the ropes and ways oh, out and God. all that. They were so outraged that they'd spoil their, the, the guards' jobs. They beat them to death slowly, tortured them over three months. To death. Having put them in little coat lockers, the soy, they called them, dragged them out in elephant chains every day and batter them senseless. Uh, internal bleeding usually did it. Um, My God. But uh, <laughs> they got a bowl of rice and a paint tin to poo in. That was it. Um, even their water was, it was just too horrible. So if you get caught, you're finished. You cannot get caught. That's what put most people off. Even my Swedish friend, Sten the Viking, he backed out at the last minute. I couldn't get people to go with me. All the other plans had um, fallen to bits because they depended on other people. Mm -hmm. I had to go out the old-fashioned way, which was um, cut my way out of the cell bars, and I needed equipment for that. And here's a really important point, I guess. As bad as this world is, you've got to try to find good people. If you ask somebody, if you ask a friend, and, and you're finished, you will manage to get a phone call and say, friend, it's Ben here. Um, I, I need you to get, um, I don't know, four hacksaw blades and cut them into the dowel rods of a, of a poster and then paint it all up and send it in a huge package with this, that cable ties, gaffer tape, but disguise all that. How many people are going to do it? Mm. They're going to turn around. Wouldn't believe it. Ben called me. What? He's knackered. Yeah, he's screwed. But anyway, he wouldn't believe it. He wants me to do this, that, and that. People don't do it. Mm. Michael, on the other hand, my old business partner, wouldn't even let me explain. He hadn't heard from me in 18 months. He said, David, don't explain. I'm sure we could get cut off. Tell me the important part now. Mm. Where do I have to be and what do I have to bring? No, that's a friend, you see. <laughs> um, and so I've always tried to do the same for, for the others that I've known like that. Um, but... Um, I did get the equipment together uh, that I needed and everything um, about escapes from a big prison is not like you hope it's going to be. You know, I timed it out, walked around the streets. It, was, when I say, it had streets inside it. Mm -hmm. um, and timed it with my trusty Casio. <laughs> and it was... So I knew roughly how long it would take to get me. But the night's a different world. Mm. I'm a prisoner. I'm only used to noise during the day, even the fan chopping around in the cell at night. It's so quiet. Everything I did squeaked and rattled and twisted. I came across a panel that had to be, a nail had to come out, and that nail protested and screamed every inch out of the way. It took um, uh, seven or eight worlds, uh, sorry, seven or eight walls to cross over say worlds because they really were. Every building was a different thing. And I got lost. And I went past the terminal AIDS ward, that building, hundreds of guys all dying. And I could smell it before I got there. Mm, God. This necrotic, rotting flesh. And I couldn't resist looking in. I'm carrying this huge long ladder made out of bamboo poles and fake picture frames gaffer taped along the center. Um... And I looked up and I saw all these little faces in the moonlight 
wrecked in so much pain and despair, they didn't have the energy to cry out to the guards. If they'd been any other prisoners, they would have. The trustees there were absolute scum of the earth, had whistled little uniforms, mm. used to sell the drugs one day and the rest of the guys for it the next, all of that. Um, and it was only by, um, well, I only got to the outer wall by dawn. And if somebody had been with me, I wouldn't have made it either. You wouldn't have? No. Uh, imagine I've taken all night to get there mm. and at each point where there's something was unexpected, I've had to dream up something. I had a little basic toolkit and I sometimes I'd have to sacrifice part of my ladder to make a hook to pull down barbed wire. And the technique for using the thing was awkward. You had to prop it, walk up, drop down the other side, mm -hmm. so you're twisting over the walls like that. One wall was entirely barbed wire, so I had to go underneath it covered in mud. The, the last one was really too high, and there was a Mars Bar Creek, the, the moat that ran around. I did, you know, if I was with somebody else, we'd be arguing, wouldn't we? Over, Mars Bar Creek? Oh, it was full of turds bobbing around. Oh, it was God. the outer sewer. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You did ask. Fairly, fairly um, illustrative. Okay, we're just going to take a quick break from the show to talk about a sponsor of this episode, BetterHelp. BetterHelp is an online counselling service which connects people to therapists and counsellors. Uh, I'm joined by one of our producers, Bryony. Mm -hmm. Is counselling something you've had experience with? Do you know what? It's interesting because when I was growing up, the same kind of challenges in life would happen, but mm. people wouldn't necessarily go to therapy or talk about therapy. Mm. And I feel like since uh, maybe my late teens, early 20s, people are starting to go to therapy and talking about it. And I have definitely used it in my life and it's been massively beneficial. Mm, same. And do you, because I think one of the things that people often mistake, they think it's just for big things. Yeah. But what's your experience of that thing? I think life always throws, you know, small challenges and large challenges. And sometimes the big things need talking about, but actually, you know, starting a new school or starting a new job can rile up that same level of anxiety and it's just really helpful to be able to talk to someone about it who is completely impartial not involved in your life and just kind of a safe space i guess to just say whatever you want to say i completely agree as the world's largest therapy service better help as much three million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available a hundred percent online plus it's affordable just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist if things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It couldn't be simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash minutes with. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash minutes with. Um, now, there was one way. Of, oh, beyond Mars Bar Creek, there's a foot and a half of land before this huge, huge wall. You've got to get a ladder that's too heavy to carry, too imbalanced mm -hmm. to do anything with, but you've got a bit of rope. How do you get it to the other side of Mars Bar, which has all got tangled barbed wire in it so it'll catch, get it in place and up against the wall when you've got no ground to, to walk on? Now, there is a way, and... Uh, I guess people have to listen to me describe it either to you or in my book. Okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> <laughs> but too long to tell here. Sure. But um, I could see the glow of dawn uh, as I got to the top, which had electricity running through it too, just to make it. The top of the wall did? Yeah, yeah. Wow. But um, my friend who um, was in there, a bit of a technician, used to belong to the Anarchist Society in, in Britain. Mm. Why would you belong to a society that has rules when you... Anyway, <laughs> putting that aside, he did tell me that it would only be 240 volts, but to, to be careful, um, and just managed to get over that. And Because the original plan was to... Um, oh, there was an outer moat beyond that of 20 metres. I had my clothes ready to go into a plastic bag, swim the moat, but mm. just as well I didn't um, because... All the, turned out all the guards' houses were over the other side of that moat. This would not be a place to go. But I cleaned myself up, threw some clothes on, and I. one of the jobs that I didn't do but I was supposed to be doing was working in the umbrella factory, so I paid a local boy to do it. Um, I got a pop-up umbrella from there. I thought, you know, you really get a perspective about, uh, I wouldn't say just simple discrimination, but being 
an outsider, a foreigner, um, the way sometimes people feel picked upon. You know, we were called the white trash and we were in, in chains and everything. So I knew I had to cover my face and the pop mm -hmm. umbrella did it. And I managed to get to a place where a passport was hidden and to the airport and still had a working ATM card to get me out of the country into Singapore. So did you end up with the umbrella? Did you walk out the front gate? Yeah, I did. Uh, I had some long trousers on. Now, in there, prisoners are not allowed to wear them, so I had some khaki pants. I thought they might, as I walked around the, the narrow path to the front gate, it's still moat, 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 but a little bridge. I thought, no, they'll figure it's a guard arriving late mm. uh, and sneaking in. And I did. I felt like Ripley and Alien uh, looking out thinking, lucky, 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 uh, this is where it all ends, doesn't it? And I'm thinking that every moment uh, and looking up. And there was just enough light rain to justify the umbrella. Uh, and I would learn later that that was actually the, not a rain from the gods, but the spittle of their laughter because what? they had worse things in mind for me later on. I mean, it's, so, it's, you know, how many people, are you aware how many people had escaped from that prison up to that point? Mm. Was it some every year or was it very infrequent? Uh, none. Um, the Thais sometimes ran away when they were doing the gardens in chains outside. Mm. But escape from within, um, I'd known of in 20 years, people could recall two attempts. Mm -hmm. No foreigners. Um, and they how? didn't trust the foreigners. That's why they put you on the third floor. Right. Uh, quite that. rightly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and wouldn't trust me. And, um, <laughs> and how long had it taken you from like the beginning of the uh, I started escape? cutting at um, 11.45. Mm -hmm. uh, I paid a lot to get a light switch in there. Mm. Normally the lights are on all the time. Um, oh, okay. And I said to my favorite guard, oh, you know, Porn Tang or whatever his name was, I can't sleep with that thing on it. I'll put a light switch in. Mm. Woof, woof, woof. Um, now, they didn't see it as corruption or bribe-taking. They thought, I'm doing this nice guy a favor, mm. and I'll be lucky because of it. Mm. Luck's a very big thing over there. You know, if I get caught, I'm unlucky then, so they can batter me to death. I mean, <laughs> sure. Uh, it's kind of uh, self-justifies any action that a human being might take. So you started cutting around 8? Uh, 11.45. Uh, 11.45, okay, it's quite close. I only got visit. through one bar by 2 in the morning. Oh, God. Sten saying, Listen, we'll go on the next night. I looked around and Kevin, the American from Hawaii, he didn't even know this was happening. Uh, Mirage, the Indian, I know he's going to talk the next morning. He was cacaria la pantalone right in the cell, never mind uh, you know, holding out and not saying anything. He would have. I, it would have been finished. I never would have made it. And I guess they could have seen the missing bars potentially. Could have. But I learned later on, I actually caught up with somebody who was in there, mm. Scottish guy. Um, he was there for selling ecstasy to the two well-off sons and daughters of wealthy policemen. Anyway, um, he remembers they, the guards couldn't figure that I'd left. Oh. Um, <laughs> he said, David, they ran around the, the prison calling out your name. It was Daniel Westlake while I was there. Daniel, Daniel. They, okay, they, somebody drew their attention to the cut bar in there. Yeah, my Scottish friend said they, the guards wondered. They thought that, okay, he's, he's got out. He's angry about something, uh, Daniel. But he's not actually, he'll never get out. He couldn't mm. get it. They never found the, the ladder down the front wall until oh, wow. much, much later. So for um, uh, only one of them said, oh, we better check the airport. And they sent a couple of guys down there. Um, just a little bit late. And you were gone by then? <laughs> Only just. And remember, Ben, you've got a passport from a, a Chinese connection mm -hmm. that you barely know, but kind of like the cut of his jib. But you're <laughs> going to put your life on the line on that. And at every moment you're handing it over, you don't like the look of it. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't like the look of it. They're typing it up and you're thinking, have they got onto the computer? Have they done that bit? Uh, have they entered my arrival? It was this, I knew it was freshly stolen or, or sold off. It was only a few weeks old. Uh, I mean, didn't, not new, it was, had only gone missing a few weeks earlier, so it was still good, but very nerve-wracking. And I didn't have a photo. I had to use my old um, 
a radio operator's license that had a photograph in it to get reproduced into this thing. So it was a bit grainy. Mm. And even on the plane, it was delay and takeoff. Oh, God. Uh, and a mumbling captain. Oh, sorry, um, we we have a thing with one passenger. I just about st- what thing mm. exactly? <laughs> Soon enough, thwump doors to manual. <sighs> but I've got an hour, you know, looking at this passport. I don't like it. Get to Singapore, but I, I make it through. So you got to Singapore, yeah. But you did end up going back to prison. Not a Thai prison, but a different prison. Are you suggesting uh, I did something wrong? <laughs> well, I'm hoping you're going to tell me. <laughs> um, no, well, okay. Uh, I didn't stay in Singapore long mm. because um, I sat there in the hotel room, unable to digest food, not prepared by my own cook. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I In the hotel room in Singapore, I realized you could work out who had left that day if they'd flown by air by simply going to the airport. Uh, Children, you work it out yourselves at home. You check everybody who's left, separate the foreigners, Hmm. go a step further, let's keep the Canadian, the American, the the British, the Australian, New Zealand, all the English-speaking passports aside, um, just to reduce the numbers. Take those names, check with the embassies, any of these names belong to lost or stolen passports that have been reported. Yeah, five of them, because that's Bangkok, you know. (laughs) Not the only mischief maker there. But nonetheless, um, they probably knew I could be, who was I? Charles McClintock. Mm. Sorry, Charles, I had to borrow your passport, but it was an essential cause. But you're not wanted anymore, of course, are you? No, but I did get an unwelcome knock at the door some years ago uh, by the police who... um, it would have been to go to <coughs> excuse me, Westminster Court, known for either terrorist cases, extradition, or parking fines. Mm. Well, I hadn't left the car anywhere lately, so it was going to be one of the other two. And it was extradition to Thailand. I fought that case for two years. Mm-hmm. And um, it was difficult, um, but managed to effectively win in the end. So the Thais have dropped that one, and I can't be taken back there. I'm not wanted anywhere. I'm, I can... Nobody can do what they want, but um, <laughs> I, I'm not. I haven't got anything pending. I'm not in business. I'm a bit cautious. I even got sent something in the the mail a few years ago, and I, I, th- I thought it was some gift from some halfwit, ambitious wombat in in Pakistan, sending me a bit of dope, thinking, "Oh yeah, yeah here's a gift. You might like that connection made." And I mean, people had my address all around the world ever since Danny Dyer. Um, it turned out to be more complicated than that, but um, very dangerous for me to walk into a courtroom. So I don't even imagine you or me. Uh, knock at the door. Uh, here's something for you, Ben. You don't like the look of it. You refuse it. You're in court. And like, Why did you refuse that? Was it mm. your name? No, right. you was up. The jig was up. Proof, ladies and gentlemen. Or. You accept it. Ah, you accepted it. Proof, ladies and gentlemen. Ah. Wife saying to me, Jeanette, whom I met in Pakistan years ago, she was there to fish out her husband on a two-ton hash deal. He didn't make it. Anyway, um, she said, throw the thing away. I'm thinking, in court again. Ladies and gentlemen, he threw the stuff away. Mm. I can't win. Mm. So very cautious about all that kind of stuff. Um, Fair enough. But I take it you won't be going for a holiday to Thailand anytime soon. I don't think so. <laughs> okay. So how many, do you know off the top of your head, of your life, how many years of your life have you spent in prison? Dismally, I did add it up once. I'm 66 now, and I suppose I've spent um, about 22 years. The thing that occurs to me and I met you before and I thought the same thing is like you're obviously extremely intelligent extremely resourceful it can't be <laughs> well <laughs> but well <Anyway. laughs> but, but do you regret the choices you made in terms of do you see those 22 years in prison as something you had no control over it's just the way the dice rolled or do you see them as a mistake on your part oh worse than a mistake mistake suggests you didn't know 
uh, where you were going wrong. Mm. I was taking those steps into uh, off a precipice that I defied. There is no gravity, I said. I will work out something before I hit mm. the ground. Um, when I w- it was kind of in stages. When I was young, it was just arrogance and, and showing off. Later on, when everything was destroyed, it was kind of, I'd s- scraped away all of my life and would just go on. Um, then in the third stage, it was escaping away from places, rebuilding up mm. and being weakened every time it was taken away again. Um, and do I regret it? Yeah, I'm sure I, um, um, not you know, some people say, oh, yeah, but David, you smuggled everything on earth, you scumbag, you, you, you know. Um, think of the lives you've destroyed and the people you've hurt. And I go to start to explain that it's not quite black and white. Uh, I mean, I've had drug habits myself that I've carelessly allowed. Um, but I thought, what's the point? Anything I say will be just, Sound like self justification. Mm. So, uh, they well, don't listen to me then, you know. But oh. things that have happened that have taught me a lot. It's interesting you say that because one of a lot of the comments on our well, the, on the first video we did, a lot of the comments were people saying someone needs to make a movie about this guy. But the, uh, a, a lot of the other comments were people saying he's so charismatic and likable, but he must be a really dangerous person to have been involved with all these worlds for so long. And um, it, it, we've interviewed a couple of drug smugglers, and I would say that the ones that I've met have been the ones that probably are more someone you'd see as traditionally quite an obviously dangerous person. Mm. You come across as very charming, charismatic, roguish. Where do you see yourself on that scale? Do you see yourself as someone who was dangerous, or do you see yourself as someone who's just moved from area to area as it occurred? Um, kind of like this. Dangerous, I suppose... What most people will see that, and you know, if somebody was a, a problem for me, uh, would I find the best option to have them killed or, or not? But really, there always was a kind of vestige of that's a failure. If you can't think of anything better than to, to have them killed, then 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 what are you doing? Uh, you, you, there's a, a million cleverer ways of, of solving your problems than that. Besides which, there, there's always going to be people. You can't kill everybody. <laughs> um, not only that, who kills the killers that you've got to do the killing? You know, you know they always say that about the quiet ones and all of that, but it, it was the people who bothered to put up a, a smoke screen. Mm. Um, they were establishing a... Um, later alibi, a courtroom personality, but I met him. He didn't seem bothered by all of that. Why would he have him killed? Mm. And those are the ones that um, seem to be more dangerous. Mm. And if I was such a dangerous person like that, I'd certainly be an absolute fool to break from that mold and say otherwise, wouldn't I? Very true. <laughs> <laughs> David, it's great to see you again. Thank you so much for coming in. Always a pleasure. Yeah, and I'm, I've got a feeling we'll be seeing you again at some point as it's well. It's possible. <laughs> <Our> paths may cross. <laughs> Thank you. I'd be like, oh my God, they're in my head. They they know. They know that was the song, and so they put that song on the radio, and it's all everything revolves around me. Or, you know, and this happened, <laughs> well, sometimes happens today. I, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking of someone in my head, someone... And they're there, Mm -hmm. like on the street.